people are so drawn to this text in particular when you start talking about 666 and the mark of the beast and the right hand and the forehead. People begin to think, well, what's this mark going to look like? What does this mark say? We are in Revelation chapter 13, beginning there in verse 11 down through 18. What you will remember from the first half of Revelation chapter 13, the ending of chapter 12. Chapter 12 is all about that great dragon, the ancient serpent, Satan, who is making war, who tried to make war against Jesus, against uh, the Son of God who came to the earth to bear our sins on the cross and was raised from the dead three days later, ascended into heaven. It made the dragon, Satan, it made him furious that he was not able to thwart the work of the Christ. And so rather than chasing Christ who had already ascended into heaven, he begins to make war on the saints of God. He begins to make war both on the nation of Israel and then also the Christians, the people of God. What you see there at the end of chapter 12 is Satan standing on the edge of the sea. You see him standing on the edge of the sea as though he were looking out over the sea and he is watching something happening. And the text almost seems to lend itself to this understanding that Satan is standing there at the edge of the sea summoning what is about to come from the sea. And it says that there rises up out of the sea the first beast who we know as the Antichrist. You can imagine that picture as it were because as we get to Revelation 16 and 17, namely 17, when you look at books like uh, the book of Daniel, namely chapter 7, you see that this beast is not only representative of the Antichrist, but it is also representative of the nations on whose back he stands the nations which he rules over. And so you can see this picture of the Antichrist looking out over the sea. And you can imagine a foreign army coming out over the sea as it would crest over the horizon as far as the eye could see. You could imagine ships coming across that sea. And they would even have the appearance of rising up out of the sea. Though we know that they're coming over uh, not the edge of the earth but over the crest there of the earth and so that first beast rises up out of the sea we'll get to that in a minute on what that may uh, or may not mean but then you begin to look at chapter 13 verse 11 through 18 and you see not a picture of the antichrist you actually see a picture of his prophet of his false prophet, the one who uh, is used of Satan by the power of Satan to deceive the nations. Leonardo da Vinci had a... um uh, an insightful quote. I don't know how insightful you have to be in order to make a statement like this, but it is true nonetheless. He said, Many have made a trade of delusions and false miracles, deceiving, quote, the stupid multitudes. And read that again. This is his words, not mine. I'm not calling anybody stupid. I'm letting him do that. Many have made a trade of delusions and false miracles, deceiving the stupid multitudes. If you don't know the truth, you are therefore susceptible to the lie. If you don't know what is right, you are susceptible to embracing wholeheartedly what is wrong. You may be embracing it unbeknownst to yourself because you lack wisdom, because you lack understanding. It is my belief after studying this text that the point of the entirety uh, of the book of Revelation and specifically tonight, our text, is to give us wisdom, to give us understanding so that when the lies come... When the chief deception of Satan comes, the Antichrist and his false prophet, when these things come, when these beings come, we'll see them. We'll see it coming from a mile away. We will identify the men and we will know their deception. We'll know their falsehood. And the point of all this is not so that we just know the lie. It's so that we will walk in the truth. So, if you want to write this down, I would summarize the, uh, the point of this text in this way. That though the deceptions of the enemy are great, the one who trusts in the word of God is both wise and discerning to walk in the truth. Look here at verse 11, Revelation 13. 
John says, then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. And so you can see that picture as well. You see Satan standing on the edge of the sea. He sees this beast, maybe even on the backs of these nations coming up over the edge of the horizon as they are rising up out of the sea. Maybe that is indicating that the Antichrist is riding on the back of foreign nations. We know that John was a Jew. John was a member of Israel. He was a citizen of Israel. And so anyone who is not Israel would appear to him to be foreign, would appear to him to be coming from the sea. And so then when you look in verse 11 and you see that now there is a beast that is rising up from the earth, part of the possible uh, understanding of that is that possibly this false prophet that arises to bear witness to the Antichrist does not come from the nations, does not come from the Gentiles. This false prophet, rather, it would seem, actually may come from the nation of Israel itself, may arise up out of the earth from somebody very near to Israel, that is. I can't say that definitively, but it seems that the text may lean there. Anyway, it says, Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. You remember the appearance there of the first beast of the Antichrist that John sees. He has the appearance of a a leopard, sleek, fast, beautiful, powerful. Its feet were like the feet of a bear immovable, strong, ready to kill, and then it had a mouth like a lion, ready to devour. This is a fierce beast, an appalling beast, a terrifying beast. There is no beauty in this animal whatsoever. You see it and you are appalled. You see it and you are amazed. You see on its body, on these heads, these blasphemous names, and you know this is a terrible creature meant to do me harm. But you remember what happens with that beast. He experiences, rather, one of his heads experiences a mortal wound in which he appears to be dead. And then he comes back to life. And you remember the response of those whose names aren't written in the book of life. Their response is, who can contend with the beast? They're not drawn to the beast because of his beauty. They're drawn to the beast because of sheer force, sheer power. They are terrified into following this creature whom we call the Antichrist. But then when you look in verse 11 of chapter 13, you see the false prophet. You don't see a terrifying beast, do you? You don't see a leopard with bear claws and a lion's mouth. What you see is a beast that appears like a lamb, a lamb with two horns. You can think of a little old lamb with those two little nubbin horns. That's what we call them when you hunt out there in East Texas and you got a deer that walks up and he's got those little nubbins. You got these little nubbin horns. Seems harmless, right? Little harmless lamb with little nubbin horns really can't do a whole lot to you. Not a terrifying animal whatsoever. It's hard to even call this a beast. It actually seems to be kind of cute, kind of beautiful, appealing to the eyes, appealing to the senses. And that's the point. The point is that this beast is appealing to the senses. It doesn't set off any alarms at all in his appearance. He's not, he doesn't look like the beast that he's testifying to. He has all of the trappings of someone who is harmless, someone who is a friend, someone who loves you, someone who is there to help you, and yet he speaks with the same mouth that the first beast does. It says that it spoke like a dragon. Different clothing, different trappings, different garments... Same lie, same deception going on. He is, in fact, you could call it this, maybe this is where this originated, he is the ultimate sheep, or wolf, rather, in sheep's clothing. He's the ultimate deception of Satan. He comes not as a terrifying beast, but as a a wolf, clothed as just this little harmless, tiny lamb. Both the Antichrist and the false prophet have the same intention, that is to steal, to kill, and to destroy, just as Jesus testified, but they have completely different appearances. Two different baits, the same um, end goal. When 
Mike and I go fishing, what we'll tend to do sometimes when the fish aren't biting is he'll put one bait on his pole and he'll work that bait and try to conjure up something and I'll put an entirely different bait on my pole. And we're doing two completely different things. Maybe he's fishing top water and maybe I'm fishing down on the bottom. Maybe I'm using a scent on my bait and he's using noise and commotion on his. We're doing two completely different things. We're clothed completely different, or rather our, our baits are comp- clothed completely differently, but they have the same goal, don't they? The same goal of catching a fish that we're going to eat. The same destructive goal as it were. Now, ultimately, here in Satan's greatest deception, that's what you have. You have two different baits with the same goal. Two different baits with the same goal in order to glorify Satan. Satan is trying to get people to honor him and worship him as God. And so he is going to counterfeit the acts of God. He is going to counterfeit the works of God. You saw that as he was cast out of heaven many ages ago, as he declared himself to be God and said, I will ascend to the throne, as it says there in the book of Ezekiel. And he's cast down to the earth and he becomes furious. And then you have the Antichrist rising up out of the sea and he essentially imitates the death and resurrection of Jesus. He has a mortal wound in which he seems to be dead and then he comes back to life and everybody marvels and wonders at this beast who was dead and is now alive. He has counterfeited the Christ. That's why we will call him the Antichrist because though he may have a fake appearance of the Christ, he is nothing like him. And he doesn't have the intention of saving people. He has the intention of stealing and killing and destroying. The same thing is true of the false prophet. The false prophet is not an imitation of the father like Satan wants to be. He is not an imitation of the Christ, of Jesus, like the Antichrist is. The false prophet is a counterfeit Holy Spirit. The false prophet is a counterfeit Holy Spirit. And you'll see that here from the text. Look at verse 12. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence. He is working again by the power of Satan, indwelt by the power of Satan, using his powers in order to deceive, and makes the earth, verse 3, and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. There his imitation of the death and the resurrection of Christ. Verse 13 says, it performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of the people. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 24, that this very thing will take place in the future. That the Antichrist, the one empowered by Satan, is not going to just come on the earth and set up his temporary kingdom here. He's going to come with great deceptions in order to deceive the whole world. He's not just going to force everyone to follow him. He is actually going to coerce them. He is actually going to manipulate them. Matthew 24, 24, Jesus is teaching about the end of days. And he says, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. When you look in the world and you see some people being healed or maybe you even see demons cast out or you see miracles take place on TV, whether they are fake or maybe they are even real what you may in fact be seeing is the work of satan you may be seeing powerful deceptions at work meant to imitate the works of god meant to deceive you into believing false lies paul said this in second thessalonians 2 9 through 10 about the coming of the antichrist He says, the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan. So he's filled with Satan, not just possessed with any demon, but by the prince of demons. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders, 
with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. One of the things that is going to characterize the end of days is not going to be just a a clear appeal to science. That's what we see today, right? Everything is explained away by science. There is no phenomena. Even if we say there is phenomena, we call it what? It's natural phenomena. It's just the way that the earth works. And we just don't understand everything about the earth. But not so at the end. At the very end, the greatest deceptions of Satan are not going to be explained away by science. They are going to be wrongly so told as the works of God. That this being is empowered by God. And that his false prophet is empowered by God. And so you should believe. Seems to be the best bait possible in order to uh, convince people of falsehood. This is not the first time that Satan has counterfeited the work of God. In fact, early on in the Bible, you see Satan counterfeiting the work of God. The Apostle Paul, when he is warning Timothy of false teachers, of the kind of of men who prey on churches, the kind of men who prey on widows, he says of them that they are like those two men back there in the book of Exodus who opposed Moses. Who opposed Moses as Moses went into the, the court of Pharaoh And he and Aaron begin to perform the signs and the wonders. And in fact, it's Paul who teaches us the name of those two sorcerers who were there in Pharaoh's court. Their names were Janus and Jambres. Janus and Jambres. You remember there in Exodus chapter 7 and in chapter 8 that there are three of the signs that Aaron and that Moses perform that Janus and Jambres actually perform. They perform it by the work of Satan, by the power of Satan, by the activity of demonic forces. You remember the first sign. God gave Moses and Aaron the sign that as they would come before Pharaoh, that they were to take Aaron's staff and to throw it down on the ground. And that wooden staff would become what? A snake. You would think that's going to convince Pharaoh to let my people go. So Aaron goes and he throws his staff there on the ground. And sure enough, just like God said, it turns into a serpent. Janus and Jambres, these sorcerers, these satanic worshipers, they take their staffs as well. And they throw their staffs on the ground. And both of their staffs become snakes. You remember what happened, though. Aaron's staff consumed the other two staffs. And Pharaoh still didn't believe Pharaoh's heart is hardened because his false prophets had attested to also some sort of supernatural power. And so he's deceived and his heart is hardened. You remember as well that it was not just Moses by the power of God who turned the Nile into blood. It was also Janus and Jambres. They also took a bowl of water and they turned it into blood. That was not some trick. That was demonic power at work. You say, how could that be? They're operating by the power of Satan, and his power is great, great enough to deceive all of mankind. You remember also that Moses, by the power of God, called up frogs, called up the plague of frogs to come over all of Egypt so that they died and it stunk everywhere in Egypt. Did that sway Pharaoh's heart? No, it didn't, because guess who else called up frogs? Janus and Jambres. But for whatever reason, Satan was unable to conjure up gnats. He was unable to conjure up the flies, and so Janus and Jambres appear to be fools. They appear to be imposters. They appear to be false prophets. And then there, as the plague of boils comes over the whole land by the power of God, Janus and Jambres can no longer even come into the court of Pharaoh because they're covered in boils as well. They're proven to be false prophets. They're proven to be anti-Christs in the beginning even. So it says in verse 13, it performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of the people. That sounds familiar too, doesn't it? 
Not only is this false prophet imitating the work of the Holy Spirit, testifying and saying, you should worship the beast. You should worship him. His power is great. You see these mighty works. Not only is he in person or testifying to the false prop or to the antichrist through his deeds in that way, but he's also impersonating the prophet Elijah. You remember there in 1 Kings chapter 18 as Elijah goes up on Mount Carmel against the 400 prophets of Baal, those who had worked for Jezebel, the queen of Ahab, king of Israel. As Elijah was up there on Mount Carmel, he had called for two sacrifices to be made. And whoever's God is the one true God, he would send fire down to consume the sacrifice. And so the prophets of Baal begin to chant and to hoop and holler. And they even begin to cut themselves with swords. And they're crying out to Baal. And Elijah is sitting in the corner saying, hey, maybe Baal doesn't hear you. Maybe he's asleep. Maybe he's taking a nap. He got tired. And then he says, hey, maybe Baal doesn't hear you. And he's not sending fire because he went to the bathroom. And he just can't hear you. He's relieving himself. So there's Elijah there at the end of chapter 18, and he goes and he gets on his knees in front of everyone, and he calls out to God aloud and says, God, to prove that you are the one true God and that I am your prophet, send fire down now to consume this sacrifice. And not only did the one true God, did Yahweh send fire down from heaven to prove who his prophet was and to prove the truth of what Elijah was saying, he not only consumed Elijah's sacrifice, he also consumed the sacrifice that was made to Baal. And you remember what Elijah did. Elijah went and got a sword and he cut down the 400 prophets of Baal there on Mount Carmel. So here in the end, it seems that Satan, the ancient serpent, he's remembered all of these things. He's remembered how God has overcome him, how God has proven him wrong, how God has proven him to be a liar and a deceiver. And so in the end, he's going to try to go out with a blaze of glory, and he is going to prove his greatest deceptions of all time. So he even makes fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. Verse 14, and this is the purpose of these signs. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. That word for image is the Greek word akon. Akon. It sounds like our word icon, and that is what it means. So the false prophet performs these signs, and the people say, what shall we do? And he says, this is what you should do. You should make an icon. You should make an image to the beast, violating one of God's commandments there in Exodus chapter 20. You shall, make, you shall not make for yourself a graven image to worship after it. Because these graven images, they're not alive. They are deaf, dumb, and they are mute. And they will not help you in your time of trouble. There is one true God. So in the end, Satan defies this command. And he has the world to construct an image, an icon, to the beast. So that people are to worship it. But that's not the greatest deception. The greatest deception is not fire from heaven... It is not the signs and the wonders that he's performing earlier on. And it's not even the, the making of this image, getting all the inhabitants of the earth to make this image in order for them to worship it. Look at verse 15, the ultimate deception. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak. And might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. When you read verse 15, you almost have to take a step back and say, wait, what has happened here? The world has made an image, must be a, quite a marvelous image, must be quite a large image to employ that many people in order to construct something. And yet here in the end, his greatest deception is that he is allowed to give breath to the image. Now, a couple of words to look at. One of the words is that word allow. That is the verb edothe. Edothe, it means to give. And it is a passive verb, meaning he is given, he is acted upon. This false prophet 
is acted upon in order to give breath. That word there is pneuma. It's where we get our word uh, pneumonia from, lungs, breath. It's also where we get our theological term pneumatology. Pneumatology is the study of the Holy Spirit. That word can be translated, pneuma can be translated breath. It can be translated spirit. So you see what the false prophet is allowed to do. He is given the authority, he is given the ability to give breath or to give a spirit to the image. So that this image is no longer deaf, dumb, and mute. This image actually now speaks. And the image actually has power and authority. And he causes those who will not worship the beast to be slain. An important question to ask here is... If that verb, edothe, is in the passive, the false prophet is acted upon and given the authority, given the ability to give this image a spirit. Who is it that gives the ability to the false prophet? Is it Satan? Well, we could answer that question very easily with another question. Who in all the universe has the power to give life? God. God gives the false prophet, he permits the false prophet the authority in order to give this image a spirit. Now, whether or not he is giving life to this spirit, the text doesn't actually say. It says that he's giving him pneuma. He's giving him a spirit. Maybe that God gives the false prophet the ability to allow this image to be possessed by a pneuma, by a spirit by a demonic spirit, and he allows it to speak. Whatever is happening here, you can bet your bottom dollar, it is supernatural. And it is amazing. It is so amazing that it deceives the entirety of the world other than the elect. And we'll get to the point here in just a minute of why is it important for us to learn about all these deceptions? Why is it important for us to to understand this here and now? Verse 15 says, And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. If he cannot amaze, if the Antichrist cannot amaze people by false signs and wonders, if he can't amaze them into worshiping the Antichrist, he's just going to have them put to death. If he can't amaze them, he'll overcome that with forceful coercion going to make people do what they want, do what he wants them to do. He's going to command them to do this and make them to do it. Verse 16 says, also it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both, both free and slave, to be marked, karagma, to be marked on the right hand and on the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of its name. So you see what he has done here now. If he cannot amaze people into worshiping the Antichrist, he's going to try to force them to worship the Antichrist, either by death or by economic pressure. He's going to make them to take the name of Satan, the name of the Antichrist, on their right hand or on their forehead. And if they refuse to take the name of the Antichrist, the number of his name, they'll be refused, or they will be refused to be allowed to participate in economics, in trade. They're not going to be able to buy or sell anything. They're not going to be able to eat. They're not going to be able to go to the market. They're just going to have to go out in the woods and scavenge for themselves or go to some sort of black market and now able in order to find something to eat. They're going to have to pay a steep price for not worshiping the beast, a steep price for worshiping Christ. Makes me think about the day that we live in that there doesn't seem to be much of a price that we have to pay here in America in order to worship Jesus. So the question that arises at this point is, what would you be willing to sacrifice? What would you be willing to pay? What kind of price would you be willing to pay in order to walk in the truth? 
in order to worship Christ, in order to avoid worshiping Satan? What sort of pressure would you be willing to endure? Would you be willing to endure death? Would you be willing to endure financial catastrophe? Would you be willing to endure starvation? These are all questions that we have to ask ourselves because if this text is correct, and I believe eternally that it is, these are things that we have to look forward to. So we may not be going through these pressures here and now, but the Bible says that one day the people of this world will. Whether this happens in our generation or not, we have to be prepared for it. And we have to ask ourselves the difficult question, what would I be willing to sacrifice in order to worship Jesus? What would I be willing to sacrifice in order just to attend church? Many times we go to church and we make plans with one another. Let's go out to eat after dinner or after church. Let's go here and let's go do this after church because we, we enjoy spending time with one another. Let's make dinner plans and let's go to this restaurant or that restaurant. What if coming to church and refusing the mark of the beast meant that there is no Sunday dinner, there is no Wednesday night dinner, you're going to come to church under the cover of darkness and you're going to run for your life as you leave? Would you still come? It makes us rethink the things that sometimes concern us when we do come to church too. The things that really, in the end of the book, those things are, are petty. Those things mean very little. Look a little more closely at verse 16. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked. That word is karagma. It means an imprintation or an inscription, an etching, maybe even a word for some sort of a tattoo, some sort of branding like you would brand a cattle, a cow. And what people get twisted up on and why people are so drawn to this text in particular when you start talking about 666 and the mark of the beast and the right hand and the forehead, people begin to think, well, what's this mark going to look like? What does this mark say? When will this mark take place? And what I think that we need to understand already is this, that you are already marked. Now, I mean that in a way that I don't think you understand that I mean it. Every person on the earth is already marked. I'm not talking about election and predestination. What I'm talking about is how our deeds mark us. Our deeds verifiably indicate whether or not we love God or we love ourselves. We are already marked, either marked with good deeds that testify that we worship God, or we're marked with our deeds that say we worship self. We don't need some tattoo or inscription in order to reveal that to people. Our Facebook pages may reveal that. Our mouth probably reveals that. The way we drive reveals who we are marked by because that's what the mark reveals. The mark reveals whether or not you are submissive to God or you are submissive to Satan. The Apostle Paul, in fact, says that he is marked with the marks of Christ. He says this in Galatians chapter 6, verse 17. He says, From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. And he is undoubtedly talking about the lashes that he's received. Those scars from shipwreck when he was imprisoned. The marks on his back from the, the whippings. The bones that have been broken, the fingers that have been disfigured from the times he's been stoned and barely escaped with his life. He says, I bear in my body the marks of Jesus already. Don't bother me. You are already marked, whether you love God or whether you love self. You may not be marked with an inscription or an etching or some sort of mark on your hand or your forehead. You're marked by your life. But this day will come where there will be a specific mark 
made on people's right hands or on their foreheads. These are not the only ones who are marked. Revelation chapter 7 and chapter 9 tells us that there is an angel that comes down from heaven and he marks, he seals those who are gods. And specifically, he seals those 144,000 of Israel and he puts the mark of God where? On their forehead. They are protected by God. They are loved by God. They are God's servants. So what is this mark? The text actually tells us. Verse 18 says, this calls for wisdom. That's an interesting statement there. And actually the literal rendering in the Greek is, here is wisdom. This is wise. And I'll get to that here in just a little bit. What is wise about this text that will make us wise? This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate. Do some work here and calculate. Work on this. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. And his number is 666. That word there, 666, is not 666. It actually is 666 when you read that in the original language. And John says this calls for wisdom. Let a man calculate it. Let him count it up and he'll know who this man is. John doesn't tell us any more than this other than one thing. He tells us that this is the number of a man. This is not the number of God. There are a few things that we can surmise from this, and we can't get very specific beyond that. One of the things that you see is this is the number of a man. This is not the number of God. As best as Satan can do to impersonate the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, he ultimately falls short, not only in his counterfeit, but also in his power and even in his name, whereas the number of completion and imperfection would be 777, his number always falls short of God, and you know that that must perturb him, that he may try to ascend to the throne of God as magnificent a being as he is, but he just always falls short. It's better in the beginning because we all fall short too. It's better in the beginning to just realize that I am not God. I will never measure up to him. And you say, Lord, I'll just submit to you. Lord, I'll follow you. You're not coercing me. You're not forcing me. You're not slaying those here on the earth who haven't submitted to you yet. You give them time. You give them mercy. You're nothing like the Antichrist. You're nothing like his false prophet. He says this is the number of a man. It's not a divine number. He's an imposter. He's a fake there are many people who have tried to calculate. They're trying to do what John says here that a man should do, calculate the number of the beast. There is a uh, tradition in uh, Babylonian history, in Greek history, Roman history, even Jewish history, a practice called uh, gematria or gematria, however you would like to say that. And it is the process of assigning numbers to alphabetical letters. And when you understand how much those alphabetical letters are worth in numbers, you can add those up and you can come up with the spelling of the name. Here's the problem with this, if we're to try to do this, because there are a lot of people who try to do this, and you can come up with all sorts of, of wacky suggestions. There have been all sorts. If you do it just right, you can calculate Hitler's name. If you do it just right, you can calculate Caesar Nero's name. If you do it just right, you can calculate Stalin's name. You can calculate all of these terrible men down through history. You can calculate their name. What's the problem with that, though? None of them have proved to be the false prophet. None of them have proven to be the Antichrist. None of them have proven to be this first beast that rises up out of the sea. The issue with it is John doesn't go any further with it. John doesn't actually tell us what the man's name is. He doesn't actually tell us. But what he does do is he gives us a number so that when we see him, when we see these lies, when we see these deceptions, we see these works that he is doing, and we hear his name, we can sit down with a piece of paper and we can calculate it and say, yep, that's the exact name that John said he would have. We don't understand it yet because it hasn't come about yet. But what this text does do is it makes us wise for the future. 
And I believe that that's the reason that verse 18 begins by saying, this is the call for wisdom. Here is wisdom. This text is meant to make you wise. These things have not taken place yet. They are terrifying. They are horrible. But in fact, they deceive the entirety of the world. And only those who love the word of God, only those who have read Revelation 13, 18, are going to know the number of this man's name. Only those who have read Revelation 13 are going to know the deceptions that he's coming with. And because they are filled with, as it says, and 18 with wisdom they're going to know it and if you are filled with wisdom and you know the things that are coming what are you going to do you're going to walk in truth that is the entire purpose I believe of Revelation 13 that though the deceptions of the enemy are great the one who loves the word of God will be both wise and discerning to walk in the truth We know these things are going to take place. We know how they're going to take place. And we know his name when we hear it. That way we can walk in holiness before God. And while the rest of the world is deceived, those who love God can walk in truth even to the end. Will you pray with me, please?